So my name is Samantha Edgington. As I said, I work at Lockheed Martin, just up the road. And uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, geostationary lightning mapper, which is on the GOES satellite, whose name I can hardly ever remember also. <laughs> the, uh, so let's see. So the GOES satellite series has been providing weather information to the United States and most of the Western Hemisphere continuously for the past 40 years. And we're going to launch a new series of satellites starting next year, March of 2016. And these will be the first series that will have a new capability to map lightning. So why would we want to be able to map the lightning? Why are we putting all this time and effort into building a new instrument and launching it and uh, processing all the data? Well, the answer to that, the most important reason, is tornadoes. So there aren't a lot of tornadoes in California. I know there was one in Sunnyvale many years ago, but it was a small one. But in Tornado Alley, there are a lot of tornadoes. And in 2011, there was a tornado outbreak in Alabama. And a lot of people lost their lives, and a lot of people were injured. And part of the reason for this is there were many tornadoes. They happened uh, over the course of a couple of days. And some of them were up to a mile wide. This particular one, uh, that I'm going to show a picture of, or the effects of, was an EF4 tornado. They go up to F5, that's the highest uh, winds. So this was a big, definitely destructive tornado. And this is a picture of one of the uh, neighborhoods that it went through uh, before, a couple of days before. And this is the neighborhood the day after. So, Essentially, the neighborhood was leveled. There were no houses, there were no trees, nothing left. Everything that uh, you see in this picture, uh, all those various vehicles are all emergency response vehicles. There are no, uh, nothing survived. And this is what we're trying to prevent with GLM. So we can't prevent the tornado from coming. We haven't figured that part out yet. But right now, a tornado warning is generally issued on average 13 minutes before the tornado gets there. That's not a lot of time to do anything. And most of them are false alarms, which means they issue a tornado warning and uh, a lot of the time there's no tornado. And what happens when people get trained that we get a warning and then nothing happens? Well, it's like the National Weather Service called, whoop, called wolf. You don't listen, and then people die when an actual tornado shows up. So what we're going to try and do with GLM is be able to measure the lightning, which will be able to tell us a tornado is coming, and the National Weather Service expects with the data from GLM we'll be able to provide warning 30 to 40 minutes ahead of time. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot more than 13 minutes, and it's about as early as you can do based on our current understanding of tornadoes. And we're also going to reduce the false alarm rate to um, much lower. So when the National Weather Service says a tornado coming, there's actually a tornado coming. And people will listen and uh, get to their basements and uh, be able to save their families. Let's see. I think. OK. The first. Um, observations of lightning from space were done by the DMSP satellites in the 70s. These are uh, military satellites, and they took pictures of lightning by accident. And um, they were just up there trying to take pictures of tops of clouds, and lightning happened, and they saw it. And they could only detect lightning at nighttime. This is because you look at a bright cloud, and there's a faint lightning flash on the top. You can't see it. But at nighttime, the cloud is dark, and so you can see the lightning. And these instruments took images with film and dropped the film out of orbit and was caught by an airplane. This actually happened before anyone had digital recorders of anything. And then they developed the film and generated these uh, videos of the weather. And so this sounds great, except we're talking days or months between when the data was taken and when you get to look at it. And so in the 90s, we launched LIS and OTD. These are two 
of the first instruments to be able to detect lightning from space during the daytime. These were built specifically to detect lightning. And this map here is a map of the lightning rate around the world um, in January, averaged. Um, so you can see that in January, it's summer in the southern hemisphere. You get a lot more lightning in the southern hemisphere. In uh, the middle of summer, in, uh, for the northern hemisphere, you get a lot more lightning in the northern hemisphere. And so these two instruments are in low Earth orbit, which means that they can see a small patch of the Earth under where they are right now as they orbit around. You get, uh, usually get to see the same spot on the Earth at most every few days. So these aren't very good for weather and um, prediction, but they're really good for telling you what lightning looks like from space. So GLM is going to launch, oh, sorry. This is the uh, original video from the DMSP satellites, what they saw from space. So this is digitized from the uh, film archives um, after they were declassified. So, the, uh, so this is what lightning looks like from space at night. And we want to be able to see that plus uh, what it looks like during the day. So we, um, GLM will be launched in 2016, and it will be in geostationary orbit, which means it will see most of the Western Hemisphere um, all at once and be operational 24 hours a day for at least 10 years, uh, maybe 15. Uh, we're required to be operational for 15 years, but um, 10 years is the expected mission lifetime. And so instead of having a small patch that you see every few days, you will see all of the United States 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week for 10 years. So this is much better for developing weather prediction. So why are we measuring lightning? And as we're spending a lot of money to do this, so why do we need to do this? The, um, the main one is the tornadoes I spoke about. We look for the jump signature, which is in a uh, storm that generates a tornado, you can measure the lightning rate within the storm. And as a lightning rate uh, gets, will suddenly get much higher and then drop off dramatically. When that happens, it's called the jump signature, and we know a tornado is going to happen. And this is, happens much more, it's much easier to predict a tornado that way than looking at Doppler radar and um, images of the clouds, which is how they do it now. You kind of have to guess that a tornado is going to happen. And they've gotten pretty good at guessing, but this will has actual data that you can plot and look at and give you a much lower false alarm rate. We also are going to help with airline traffic flow management. You do not want to fly an airplane through convective weather, which is a thunderstorm. If any of you have been on an airplane that's done that, it's bad news. And a lot of airplanes, any of the airplanes that um, have severe issues or crash, a lot of it's because they went through convective weather when they shouldn't have. And it's, so you want to avoid it. But then we spend a lot of time and money and fuel going around what might be convective weather. And uh, GLM will tell you whether it is or is not going to be a problem for uh, airlines. And that can save the United States billions of dollars a year in uh, extra fuel and time for weather delays. And the third one is climatology. Lightning is powered by the temperature of the land underneath uh, the storm. And so the rate of lightning should be related to the temperature of the land, which will help us understand climate change. LIZ, the uh, lightning imaging sensor, was launched in 1997. It's still going. It's hanging on. It's, uh, the satellite that it's on has lost its last reaction wheel, which, if you know anything about satellites, means that it's kind of on its way out. We can't do anything to help it anymore. And it's probably going to fall out of orbit over the next year or so. But um, if we can get GLM up there, it will continue taking that data. So we'll have from 1997 uh, continuously out from 2016 to uh, have all of our lightning data to look at climate change. So how do you build a satellite? So the first thing you do is write down what you want it to do. 
How do you know when you've built something that does what you need it to do? So we have a lot of what are called requirements. And then we have to build the instrument to meet those requirements, and then we have to prove that we met the requirements before we launch it. So the most important requirements for GLM are our, we call them our performance requirements. They are the requirements that tell you how much lightning it has to be able to detect. We need to be able to detect 70% of the lightning flashes. And we also want to have a false alarm rate that's very low. So that when we say it's a lightning flash, there really is one. And it's not just some random noise from our electronics or a radiation hit or something like that. And if we can detect 70% of the lightning flashes, we'll be able to see this jump signature. And we'll also be able, if we have a low enough false alarm rate, we'll make sure that predictions for tornadoes and other convective weather is, uh, has a low false, event rate, false alarm rate. And we also want to have good enough resolution to see the ground. So in geostationary orbit, you're about 36,000 kilometers away from the ground. But you want to be able to see small enough patches on the ground and resolve them to be able to follow a storm cell. Storm cells are tricky. They don't stay still. They move across the, um, the ground at sometimes relatively high speed. And so you want to be able to track it and see uh, individual storm cells and track them across where they're going. So how do we do this? So in order to detect lightning, a lot of people think of lightning as these flashes, as forks that come down from a cloud and hit the ground. And that is a very small portion of the actual lightning that happens. Most of the lightning happens inside the cloud. And if you remember the little video of what the um, lightning looks like from space, all we see from space are these blobs of light coming out of the top of the cloud. And so we can see all the lightning. This lightning that hits the ground, the lightning that's within a cloud, the lightning that goes from one cloud to the next, and it all looks the same. But lightning isn't, doesn't occur as one big, long flash of light. What actually happens is it's more like a strobe light. There's lots of individual pulses of light. And if you're ever in a thunderstorm, which I know happened a lot around here, but maybe you're on vacation, and there's a thunderstorm, if you see lightning out of the side of your vision, you might be able to tell that it kind of looks like a strobe light. Your eye's better at telling that from the side than straight on. And so what GLM looks for are these individual pulses. And they are usually on the order of a millisecond long. And there's usually 10 to 20 of them in any given lightning flash. And so we look for these individual pulses. So how would we do that? Basically, we put a high-speed video camera in orbit with a huge telephoto lens on it to look down at the Earth. So we have a CCD running at about 500 hertz, the ones that are in your cell phone camera. They're not CCDs, but they're similar. They usually run at about 30 frames per second. We're running at uh, more, about more than 10 times that. And we can't put all that video down to the ground. The, instrument, the satellite we're going on has a lot of other instruments on it. They have a lot of data and, uh, that they need to put down to the ground. So we need to fit in a very small downlink rate, about almost 8 megabits per second. The amount of video coming out of our camera is s tens of gigabits per second. So we can't send all of that to the ground. So what we do is we have hardware. And you can see that hardware over here. This little innocent looking box right here does um, the power, the communication, and also the real time event processor. So basically, it looks at the video stream pixel by pixel, and if anything changes from one frame to the next, it alerts, uh, it sends the, it calls in an event, and it sends it down to the ground. So basically, GLM shoots anything that moves. So it looks, it stares at the earth, and anytime there's a change, it sends that information down to the ground. Now you might think, how do I know that change was a lightning event and not a radiation hit or some kind of electronics noise or any number of other things? And what we do is we have a lot of software that happens on the ground that looks through all of these events. We expect to get on the order of 50,000 events per second coming down to the ground. And it looks through all of these events and looks for the signature of lightning. And based on all the data from Liz and other um, ground-based lightning 
mapping instruments, we can have a very good chance of saying, this is lightning and this is just noise. We can just forget that. So that's a lot of processing that has to happen. And all of this happens in 10 seconds. We go from the lightning happened on the Earth, the amount of time it takes to go from the Earth up to the satellite, for the satellite to detect everything, to send all of the information back down its um, communications link to the ground, and for that data to be processed and sent out to the National Weather Service takes less than 10 seconds. And so that's what we're looking for, because if you're trying to get your warning to 30 or 40 minutes, you can't spend 10 of those minutes messing around trying to get your data from one place to the other. So all of that has to be very um, streamlined, and we have to have nice big computers to analyze all this data. Or at least they were nice big computers when we started seven years ago. They are kind of medium-sized computers now. So this is a view of the inside of the instrument. So on your left over here, we have the outside of the instrument. And it doesn't look very exciting. It kind of looks like a blender. Um, we have a, the top part is a baffle that blocks uh, light from the sun from coming in from the side. There's a door on the top that opens once we launch so we can see out. And um, the portion, the silver covered portion, this is covered with uh, it's called MLI blankets. These are blankets to keep it warm or keep it cold, depending on whether the sun's shining on it or not. It's basically um, a space blanket, like the ones you might have in your emergency pack, are based on this, uh, uh, these blankets. And then we have the electronics unit. That one doesn't get blankets because it sits inside the spacecraft and is nice and toasty in there. And, the, um, and we have a big radiator a little hard to tell from this picture down here, but um, when GLM sits on the, this is a picture of the GO satellite. There's a big instrument on the Earth pointing platform, that's ABI, that takes the cool pictures of the uh, clouds that you see on weather.com. And then we will, we are right nestled in next to it with a big radiator because when you run at uh, 500 hertz, a CCD at 500 hertz, that takes about 200 watts. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot when you're on a spacecraft. They put an extra solar array panel on just for us. And so this is the inside. The light comes down, and basically the first thing we do is get rid of most of it. We don't want to see all of this light. What we want to see is just the one particular wavelength that is um, that the lightning emits at, which has uh, got the highest signal-to-noise ratio between the lightning and the background cloud. So we throw away most of the light, and uh, we get down to a narrow band filter is one nanometer across, and that's very narrow. It leads all kinds of problems when you're trying to measure it. And then it comes through to our focal plane, which is CCD, and then there's a digitizer, turns into bits, and then we go over about two and a half meters of cable and go to the real-time event processors, and then it gets sent to the ground, and we look at our data and determine what the flash rate is and whether we need to warn people about tornadoes. So the first out of four GLMs is currently attached to the uh, first GOES R series satellite. That satellite will be launched in 2016. And soon after that, after testing, the first testing is done on orbit, we'll start seeing uh, lightning in the weather forecasting and we'll start saving lives. Or as one of my colleagues put it, we will uh, start telling the tornado chasers exactly where to go. So hopefully we won't uh, cause them to lose their lives, but most rational people who do not chase tornadoes will help save their lives. <laughs> so, the, uh, so hopefully at the end, uh, mid to end of 2016, we'll be up and running and sending data out to the National Weather Service. Thank you very much.